Tens of thousands of Chilean students once again take to the streets of Santiago calling for greater reforms to their country's education system. How far should the government go to fulfill their demands? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu. It became known as the Chilean winter. For several months last year, tens of thousands of students from high schools and universities across the country organized sit-ins, large marches, and even a massive choreographed street dance. They're demanding a free education system for all. Chile's education system is one of the most privatized in the world. And when adjusted for the average income, the country's universities are among the most expensive. As the protests grew, the popularity of the center-right president, Sebastián Piñera, declined to the lowest level of any Chilean president in modern history. This week, the government announced some reforms, including a reduction in the interest rates on student loans. But protesters say the measures do not go far enough. They resume massive marches and say they will not stop pushing until their demands are met. Teresa Bo has more from Santiago. Chilean students are back on the streets in order to demand a free education. And this is happening at a time when President Sebastián Piñera is sending to Congress a tax overhaul that he says would allow the government to gain around $700 million that would allow them to make significant reforms to Chile's education system. The government has announced that from now on, it will be the state and not the banks who will be funding higher education scholarships. They say that the state will charge 2% interest rate instead of the 6% that banks have been charging until now. Students say that the government's proposal is not enough, that they want access to free education like in other Latin American countries. They say that education in Chile is treated as a commodity governed by market forces. And this is something that has been going on in this country since the dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet back in the 1970s. Analysts say that since then, most basic services in Chile have been privatized like education, healthcare, and even the pension system. And that's one of the reasons why the Chilean students have so much support amongst the population here, because in a way they represent the general disenchantment with the situation here, most families end up in debt when they send their children to school. What many people here tell us is that Chile has been growing steadily in the last year, but that inequality continues to be very high. So what's at stake for President Sebastián Piñera as the protests reignite? And should the government do more to satisfy the demands of the students? To discuss this, we're joined by Patricio Zamorano, a professor at George Washington University. His sister is one of the student leaders in Chile. We also have Juan Carlos Hidalgo, a Latin America analyst at the Cato Institute, a think tank in D.C. that promotes free market policies, and by Eric Farnsworth, vice president of the Council of the Americas. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Now, before we get into what is happening right now in Chile, you know, with the student protests and the government's response to uh, what is going on. Let's look at a bit of background. Chile's education system, as we've been reporting, has been uh, and still is one of the most privatized in the world. And many households pay up to 40 percent of their income paying for tuition for their children to go to schools. Um, has that always been the case in Chile? Actually, uh, not only the fact that the education is, is in private hands, the problem under the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, what happened at that time is just the, the state sent the administration of the education system to the, to the min municipalities. So basically every single city now had the control over the education in that particular area. What happened with that was the fact that uh, since we, we have very poor areas, in Chile and in Santiago and very rich areas, what, what happened was is every single city had to control that according to their incomes. And of course, the, the poor municipalities had a lot of problems and they are delivering and for the last 40 years a very poor education, public free still, but you, you have that inequality be, be, between rich areas and poor areas. So it's not only the fact that it is in private hands, but the, the, the state abandoned its mission uh, in terms of a universal, high-quality 
education system in so Chile. So it's, it's not a level playing field, is it? Exactly. It's not, it's okay. not level at all. Well, let's look at some of the numbers related to education in Chile. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development estimates that Chile is one of the most economically segregated countries in the world mm -hmm. in terms of education opportunities. Just 40% of Chilean children receive a free secondary education, mm -hmm. with the rest attending charter or private schools. For higher education, tuition fees cost 3400 dollars a year in a country where the average yearly salary is $8,500. And upon graduating, students on average are saddled with about $40,000 worth of debt. Let's go to Eric Farnsworth. Eric, is this sustainable in a country which has clearly seen a lot of economic growth? I mean, the per capita income since 1990 has tripled. But can this go on? Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right. And I think you, what you're seeing is Chile is growing, but you have rising expectations of the population, which says, you know, look, together, all of the population needs to gain in the benefits of this uh, growth that's been very productive, very positive at the macroeconomic level. But as you quite rightly say, it hasn't been evenly distributed. So as those expectations rise, uh, you have people who are demanding education, which is really the key to uh, full participation and success in the global economy. And by doing so, they're looking to reorient the um, education system in Chile to be, as they perceive it, much more fair. Okay. Juan, you come from an organization that promotes free market policies. Is it working here? Let's look at the facts. Chile has the best education system in Latin America. Compared, when you compare Chile to other Latin American countries and on coverage But is it the higher, best education system for some only? No. Actually, if you look at four, the coverage for higher education is 45%. It's the highest in Latin America. It's 70% uh, uh, of the 1.1 million students in higher education right now are the first in their, in their families, the first generation in their families to access higher education, which means that more and more Chileans are getting the opportunity to study, compared to only 200,000 back in 1990. So you have growing opportunities here. And if you look at uh, PISA scores for, for high school students, the Chileans outperform consistently people from Brazil, people from Argentina, Uruguay, and Mexico, and other countries that do these scores. So if you look at uh, numbers, if you look at, at, at the data available, you can see that indeed Chile has a very high quality education system. Now, it's expensive. The question here that we should be discussing is, is it going to be more egalitarian if the government pays for the education of higher of, high, of, of university students, the evidence, as we can see in other Latin American countries, is that actually it increases inequality once the government pays for higher education because the people who tend to go to a higher learning educa system, education system, tend to be the well-off. So it's basically subsidizing rich people. Exactly, and you right. see that in, in Chile, you well, see that in Brazil, you okay, see that in Argentina. Yeah. And it's exactly what's what's going on in Chile now. We don't have actually a problem in terms of access. Actually, that's, that's very true. Seven out of ten uh, new uh, students, they are first generation actually in college. But the problem is quality. And the problem is who is paying for that. And the state is not financing that in a, in a fair way. You, you consider actually some of the numbers. A tuition a year costs be, between $4,000 and $8,000. If you consider that 50% of the labor force is, is making the minimum salary, which is around $400, or 55% is making around $1,000, or 75% is making at least uh, $1,500. You do the math. It's impossible for the middle class and, of course, for the poor family to, to get access. So the government is the only factor that can actually improve the the inequality in this system, and the system now is totally broken. And the proof is the huge crisis that we have in two, in 2011. Uh, some of the protests had 200,000 people, 400,000 people, really expressing their their concerns about this. We are not talking about access here. We are talking about quality and uh, uh, equal tools, basically, to bring to to deliver to every single child the the uh, child the same opportunity to develop. According basically. to mm -hmm. according to UNESCO, mm -hmm. and the average the average Chilean student takes 10 years to pay down his student debts. Mm -hmm. 10 years. This is not. We're not talking here about like 20 years, 30 years. I mean, there are, of course, dramatic cases that are, that are representing the media. Sometimes. Well, I mean, we're talking but, about average debt of $40,000 in a country where the average income per year is $8,500. The average, well, but you have to it's look at the fair, differences yeah. in debts. But the average Chilean student gets, it takes 10 years for him to pay uh, the, the, the student loan. Yeah. Of course, there are examples 
of people who don't get to pay their student loans uh, like in, in oh. short time. Why? Because one of the reasons that we see in Chile is that many students go for careers that are not uh, well qualified in the, in the job market. Uh, for example, if you look, study anthropology or if you study, study geography or, or puppetry <laughs> or something like that, uh, and you don't, you don't find a, a good opportunity okay. in the market, yeah. of course you're going to have a hard time then okay. paying your student loan. Patricia, I'll give you a chance yes. in a moment. Let me go to Eric Farnsworth. Uh, Eric, the president has announced a rehaul or a restructuring of the manner in which taxes are collected in Chile. Uh, businesses are going to be paying more now. He's talked about a $700 million uh, amount of money which is going to be set aside for education. Is that going to do it? Well, I don't know if it's going to do it, but uh, certainly people are willing to pay for quality. And particularly from the private sector perspective, what we've seen not just in Chile but throughout the Western Hemisphere is a real skills gap. In other words, a gap between the education levels and the skills of graduates of colleges and secondary schools and what the needs of the private sector are. So you have a real mismatch in many countries, and Chile isn't an exception. They've done better than most, and I think that's accurate, but they still have quite a wide skills gap. And so what you see from the private sector is a real uh, strong focus on competitiveness and global competitiveness and the need to find skilled and qualified workers. And so I think they would be willing and they are willing to uh, put uh, additional resources behind that to the extent that there is a real faith that those resources would be used effectively. Let me also raise uh, a point that was, or comment on a point that was raised by the guests uh, earlier. It's absolutely true that Chile's comparative uh, success in education compared to its peers in Bolivia and some of the other countries in South America is quite good. Chile ranks quite high compared to other Latin American countries uh, in terms of skills of its graduates in math and reading and all that. But if you compare Chile to the OECD countries, the developed countries, the countries that Chile is trying to compare itself to economically, Chile in fact ranks quite low and has uh, quite a lot of work to do. So this idea that it's not just resources I think is ab absolutely right. It's also very important to focus on the idea of quality education and turning out graduates from a broad sector of society and developing human capital for full participation in a global economy. Okay, Juan, you want to respond to that? Yes, I would like to, I would like to point that out. Exactly. If you compare Chileans to Brazilians, Argentinians, Mexicans, they outperform them when it comes to uh, results, educational results. But the question here is who should pay for higher education? That's the whole point. The student, pro the student movement in Chile says that the government should pay, should offer completely free ha access to higher edu education. If you see what happens in other Latin American countries where that's the case, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, you see that 80 to 60 percent of the, of the people who are enrolled in universities in those countries come from the 20% richest segment of the population. Mm -hmm. So where you actually have a system where the taxpayer is subsidizing the well-off, and that actually increases inequality. Mm -hmm. And there is actually a report by, by a Chilean think tank that shows that either, if the government were to offer high, free, higher access, free access to higher ed education in Chile, 41% of the resources will go to the 20% high, uh, highest income levels, whereas only 9% whereas only 9% will go to the poorest sector segments of society. So actually, if you want a more equal Chile, then you exactly you have to avoid having higher free access to higher education because that actually increases inequality, not reduces it. Okay. Actually, we, we can agree on part of that. I think, uh, personally, as, an, as a political analyst, I consider that the education uh, should be, uh, uh, in, in terms of the tuition, should be according to the incomes of every single family. Mm -hmm. Because the situation that we have now is exactly what you were mentioning, mm -hmm. that uh, the public uh, education is uh, in, in, in Chile, specifically Universidad de Ch Chile, who is the, what is, the, uh, is the best one, actually, in the country, uh, uh, they are subsidizing rich people because they are <laughs> selected using a, a national exam and the best results uh, actually belong to the richest families who have a better uh, elementary schools, better right. high schools, so better uh, nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. So we have that inequality in terms of the access. So the government is the only one who can uh, prevent that from happening, uh, mm -hmm. trying to uh, uh, increase education from the very bottom, from, from 
early ages. But now, so that's the important. We cannot subsidize. I totally agree uh, uh, yeah. with but that. We cannot subsidize rich people. The education, the public system, should be focused on people who cannot afford it. Right? But the main, mm -hmm. the main demand of mm -hmm. the student movement in Chile is that yes. free, higher yes. education should be free for all. Yes, even well, the rich. Actually, that's, actually, the, that's their demand, no? Actually, the the movement, if you read the the actual position, is extremely diverse. No, no, all the students, no, all of the groups. If you listen to with, Camila with Vallejo and the rest, exactly. But it, it's extremely diverse. Uh, you really need to do a a, a, a a very deep analysis there because certain groups want more like a like a fair kind of like a, 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 a according to the to the income system. Another group wants 100% free. Uh, another people. Actually, are focused on on uh, college time right. versus another groups who are trying to face more elementary school, high school. So it's, it's it's extremely diverse. Don't make the mistake assuming that the movement in Chile is just unique. Actually, it's extremely diverse. Okay, mm -hmm. let's go back to uh, Eric. Eric, you made an interesting point earlier on about the skills of graduates. You know, uh, Chile depends to a large extent the Chilean economy on minerals, copper specifically. Right. Um, the price of copper is going to come down one of these days. Uh, the country is not diversified enough. Has it provided, uh, and is it going to provide the human capital that's going to be needed when that diversification is needed, uh, takes place? Well, I think that's a real question, and it affects Chile. It also affects, frankly, all of the countries that are uh, primary goods exporters or commodities exporters in South America, certainly Brazil, Argentina, Peru. Uh, and it might not be copper with those economies, but maybe it's iron ore or agriculture products, soy products, what have you. And this is a real issue because economies that are not diversified, that rely too much on one particular product, yeah, they have some very fine engineers and some very fine uh, students going into those sectors. But if you are not concentrating broadly, and developing the full range of your human capital on uh, skills like entrepreneurialism and uh, ways to start new businesses and all of these things that are not necessarily related to the extractive industries, then in fact, uh, we all know that uh, commodities markets are cyclical. When that cycle goes down, the country doesn't have a whole lot more to rely on. Now, Chile has been diversifying, and certainly their outreach to Asia, the country's outreach to other economies, both in Latin America and elsewhere, I think is proving effective through trade agreements and investment and that sort of thing. But there's a long way to go. And if you don't have a cadre of well-qualified, uh, trained workers, then uh, in fact, if you do hit those uh, economic uh, depressions or difficulties, uh, then they are longer lasting than in fact they need to be because you just don't have the qualified workers to draw the investment in the other sectors that you require. Okay. Let's uh, look at what the Chilean president, Sebastian Pinero, has been saying about these reforms that he's announced, the $700 million that he set aside for education. They're also talking about reducing interest rates for students. Um, he did talk on Chilean television when this announcement was made. Let's listen to what he said. This is a profound change. What it seeks to do is to transform education into a large-scale mechanism for the creation and equalization of opportunities, for both quality and equality. Patricio, is he being a little bit ambitious there when saying those things? He's very ambitious, and 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 let's remember this: uh, Piñera himself, he's a very rich man. He's he's one of the four richest families of Chile, <laughs> and we have to to say this: the four families to, together make around, or or they are they are worth a, around a forty-two billion dollars, which is eighty percent of the income so of all Chileans for for one year. So in fact, he knows. Uh, from inside that uh, a certain uh, uh, sector of the population has to deliver a little bit more. He's actually doing, I would think, saying the big corporation, we need to tax you more mm -hmm. and we need to generate that that equal uh, 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 access to, uh, to education. But uh, I insist you got to change the model that, that the, which is 100 percent the legacy of the dictatorship we need to change that it's, it's unequal it's not working it's broken uh, uh, the education uh, in Chile was was almost 100 percent privatized a lot and that's that's actually not working so those are the real facts. That, that's why we have this crisis now. We don't have the crisis because the state is intervening more. We have the crisis be, because we don't have that way to compensate a little bit more access, fair access of, uh, to good quality education in Chile. I don't think there is a crisis out there. If you will have a crisis. You know, there's, no, I mean, <laughs> there is actually there is social, the streets. There is a, definitely there is social unrest. The yes. But again, let's look at the facts and let's look how Chile is doing 
compared to other countries. Mm -hmm. But look, yes, Sebastián Piñera is a very weak president. Mm -hmm. He lacks a backbone. He doesn't have core principles. Mm -hmm. the, the Economist magazine even describes him as an inept president. And I think that that's part of what's going on in Chile right now. Mm -hmm. Some sectors of the student movement um, from the left in Chile smell blood in the water because they know that they're facing a very weak president look, that lacks core principles, and that's right, why they're radicalizing themselves. You know, and as, as to, we reported to get, at the outset, his approval it? ratings among the Chilean voters is at an all-time low. It's the lowest it's low, in yeah. modern history. Precisely because he doesn't convince voters in, in Chile that he is a principal man. He is all, he's out there just looking for, for popularity, and many people, many Chileans know that. If you look at how what Chileans think of the of the student movement, too, the, the popularity has been declining. In, but in this, the recent, but in this recent issue years. resonates yeah. with the Chilean people. Less than 50 yeah. percent of Chileans agree that that, that uh, higher education should be free, and and I think that and the numbers are have been declining. But, but once it, but once the facts once the facts 70 percent of the population agree with the movement. Actually, they what? they agree that we have a crisis. It's a huge crisis. It that there the, is something wrong. The, yeah. the highest level of of police. Repression happened in 2011, so many years after the dictatorship. We cannot blame the, the dictatorship about that. So there is no doubt that the, the country was paralyzed for, for eight months. A thousand of, of injured people, policemen injured. It you was have a to huge that. crisis there. So you have to uh, there is no doubt that we, that, and President Piñera, his first priority now is education. He knows that Patricio, he got to do something about that. Patricio, right? but you yeah. agree You agree mm -hmm. that certain segments of the mm -hmm. student, uh, uh, Chilean student movement are radicals, mm -hmm. that they're not questioning only the education sector, mm -hmm. the education system mm -hmm. in Chile, but they're uh, questioning the whole economic system exactly that right. has mm -hmm. provided uh, a reduction in poverty from 45% in mm -hmm. 1980s to 15% uh, now, yeah. mm -hmm. that has tripled the incomes, the per capita mm -hmm. incomes mm -hmm. of Chileans in the last uh, 20 years yes. yeah. to the highest in Latin America. America, that is, uh, the has uh, given Chile the, the, the soon-to-be uh, uh, chief status mm -hmm. of the first developed country yeah, but in Latin well, America. Well, let's, let's the problem that, okay. that, the problem that just, just to answer that, the problem yeah. that, that we have here is not a comparison between Chile and uh, another country. It's okay. the expectations being well, ge generated yeah. within the c society. A students, poor, poor family, right, they right. don't which care is, about which the, is, the comparison right, Which is with, a point with that Eric Peru. made yeah. right at the outset of the program. Eric, you wanted to say? Yeah, let me jump in if I yeah. can, because I think that uh, this is a valid point in terms of the politics surrounding this. Look, I mean, the education system in Chile uh, probably does need some reforms. It is a holdover. There are some things that need to be changed. But to the extent that this movement becomes hijacked or taken over or even accepting of more radical elements that have different interests that are creating violence and all kinds of things that are really not in the interests of the students uh, yeah. who are pursuing education reforms, okay. I think that's counterproductive, mm -hmm. and I think it's ultimately not going to be supportive of the reforms that they claim to want. Okay, well, I wanna, sorry, I want to get to one of the student leaders very quickly, Camilo uh, Vallejo, who is one of the prominent her. student leaders. She wants to work within the system. Let's take a look at what she said uh, recently about the government's uh, reform proposals. What is perverse about this system is that it was necessary to eliminate private banks from the agenda, but that doesn't resolve the problem of profiting from education. The student financing proposal by the government just reinforces the subsidies for those who profit from educational institutions. Uh, she has succeeded in getting education to be a priority for this government, hasn't she? She is the most prominent leader, and you said so. She's a leader of the Communist Party in yeah. Chile. Let's, so let's, let's put it into context. She just went to Cuba where she praised Fidel Castro. She is a big supporter of Hugo Chavez's policies in, in Venezuela and so on. So let's put into context who Camila Vallejos is. And indeed, she has questioned the whole economic model of Chile. She has said that after education, they will go to promote nationalization of natural resources industries in Chile, that, that she's against the private pension system in Chile. Okay. So, I mean, we're talking about a very radical figure here who, again, is the most prominent uh, leader of the okay. student movement. Okay, Patricia, you, ha you have the last word. Is she a radical figure? Well, she's <laughs> she just <laughs> amazing leader of 23 years old, uh, uh, extremely peaceful, extremely smart. Uh, she, she was named a person of, of the year or a woman of the year by, by the New York Times, The Guardian. I'm sure that yeah. there are no 
communists or or they are not being paid by 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 the communist party it's just we don't have to stereotype that uh, her okay. parents are also from from the, from the, the communist party they are not violent pe people at all they are they are very smart she's coming from an intellectual family and she's been extremely uh, extremely smart on on the violent part she's okay. been extremely clear that the movement is is, okay. is peaceful and that's why the movement enjoys this international uh, uh, legitimacy because of that the the repression came from the state unfortunately the 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 police of chile has a long story of of, of being extremely violent in this case it was exactly that time i think that's why 70 percent of the population in chile agree with the student movement and international legitimacy is actually very strong also. okay patricio thanks. zamorano juan carlos hidalgo and eric fonsworth thanks to all of you for joining us thank you and that is it from the team here in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, where you can find more information about the program. And, of course, we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. Thanks for watching.